Greetings, everyone, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, once again, is David Lewis Jones, More Excellent Ministries. I pray that your week has been blessed and that you are staying safe in all of his ways. Once again, it is our Bible study night. I believe that I have a word from the Lord to give to you on tonight. So please uh, join, come into this broadcast, this live stream. I pray that you will have an ear to hear uh, what I believe God would have to say uh, to his children on this evening. Uh, tonight we have a special word for you. I want you uh, to join in. Uh, please join in at the broadcast as they're coming in uh, to listen and to hear what God has to say for you tonight. I want to speak to you tonight uh, from a very important subject, a topic uh, concerning your belief system your beliefs system. Um, I believe the Spirit of God is telling us that our belief system has been compromised. Our belief system has been compromised. We, as the people of God, uh, do not quite understand uh, the terminology uh, which the Bible calls uh, in the Bible when it speaks about belief. So before we go into this message, we're going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for again uh, this opportunity uh, to come to you in this hour uh, to hear from heaven. I ask that you would anoint me with fresh oil to deliver uh, this message to your people, God. Open the ears of the people that they may hear uh, what the Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, your belief system uh, has been uh, compromised. Now, according to the Bible, um, you probably have seen and even read, of course, uh, the word believe in the Bible. It's mentioned numerous of times uh, in the Bible. However, um, from a American uh, culturalized aspect, uh, we interpret that word belief uh, meaning something uh, that we must do mentally or a mental uh, understanding or believing in God or believing in prayer. Now, uh, just to mention, and I believe I've spoken about this, the Bible is not an American book. It was not written by Americans. Uh, it was not written for Americans. It was written by Jews. Uh, for Jews to Jews uh, over thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, uh, just that alone um, should stir you to understand that it's a book that is uh, not from our culture. Uh, it is from the Eastern or the Middle Eastern culture. So um, it's hard to bridge this gap f from two different cultures, two different countries on each side of the planet uh, to try to understand it. That's why I don't uh, particularly uh, study the Bible in the English version uh, because it was not written in English. It was written in Hebrew and in Greek. Now, understanding those particular languages uh, can be very vast. The Hebrew language is a very extensive, very uh, exhausting language, and so is the Greek. Uh, so these words that are in the Bible, and we're reading it from an English version, uh, we have a limited understanding, which means we don't get the full meaning of the text, uh, reading, right, reading it in, in the English version. Now, from a point of belief, meaning our belief system has, has been compromised uh, because uh, we see belief as, again, something from our minds, from a mental aspect, uh, which the Bible is not speaking anything about it being mental, as I'm about ready to show you. Okay, Now, uh, belief or to believe in the Bible simply means to obey. Now, that should right there take your whole understanding on what belief and what believing is. Belief in the Bible means to 
obey. So when the Bible says to believe in God, it simply means to obey God. It's not something that you just say, I believe, or I believe in God. Uh, that's not the communication of what the scriptures are saying. And this is what is happening and has happened and will continue to happen to many, thousands of Christians who do not have this understanding. Not to mention the non-Christians who say they believe in God. Because belief in the Bible simply means to obey. It is not something just to say or just to think because we're dealing with God. Now, when, when we're dealing with God, the communication between God and man is, is different. God does not communicate, nor does he receive communication as we do one to another. The reason being is because God is a spirit. He exists in the spirit realm. Therefore, there's a certain way of communication between the natural realm and the spirit realm which if you do not understand the pattern or the method of how to communicate um, your, your prayers and your, your relationship with God will be impacted and affected. Uh, because God says, if you believe in me, you will obey me. Okay? If you believe in me, you will obey. Now this eliminates a whole lot of things. But because most, again, Christians simply say, say that they just believe in God, but then they are disobedient. It says that's not, that's not believing in him. So believe means to obey God, simply means to obey God. Whether you say you believe in God and you're telling God that I believe you, he does not receive it as you are intending it to, to project upon him. He says, in order to believe in me, you must obey me. Believe in God does just not say, I believe. Belief in God is not something you just keep in your mind just to say, I have it. God does not view that as belief. He, believe, he views belief as obedience to him or a strict adherence to the word, to obey his word, uh, to abide in his word, to walk in his word. That's how the spirit receives to believe. Now, amongst us, it's a different uh, definition uh, because, again, God is a spirit. We're humans. He speaks in different languages and a different communication pattern than we do amongst ourselves. So if we don't understand the communication process or the pattern or the definitions of how God says believe in then, then again, our relationship with him is going to be impacted. Another thing, what you do is what you believe in. What you do is what you believe in. People do not do anything that they do not believe in. And this is why I, I tend not to play close attention to when people are talking because uh, people can say anything, uh, especially Christians. Um, I watch what you do because whatever you're doing in all aspects of light is simply because you believe in it. You do not do anything in light that you do not believe in. When you turn the faucet on, you believe that there is going to be hot or cold water to come out the faucet. When you sit down in a chair, you believe that that chair is going to hold you. When you get in the car and you put the key in the ignition, you believe that car is going to start. Everything is, co is coming from a belief system. Um, it's coming from what you believe in. The Bible says uh, that the issues of life spring from the heart. In other words, uh, what the, the writer was saying that life is not lived externally. Life is lived internally. Uh, the problem and the challenge with many of Christians is that most of you all are living from an external perspective and not from an internal perspective. And this is why Christians 
are not advancing, not proceeding, not receiving their blessing, their healing, their deliverance, their miracle is because most Christians, I would say a high percentage of Christians are living in this external realm and not the internal realm or the spirit realm because their, be their belief system has been compromised. They're thinking that if I just believe, I will receive. Well, again, belief has nothing to do from a mental point of view. It means simply to obey. So what you do is what you believe in. What you do not do is because you do not believe in it. When I partake of communion, I believe that this cup is the blood of Jesus Christ. This bread is the body of Jesus Christ. And I believe that he is with me at that present time, at that particular table, as he says. The reason why people do not commune with God is simply because they do not believe it. And this is what's happening to many Christians. You do not do anything you do for God is simply because you do not believe it. Even in prayer, even in prayer, many Christians Many are praying, but they are not believing in the sense that the Bible text says to believe. Many Christians are believing from a mental point that if I just believe and keep believing and believing that what I'm praying for, I'm going to receive, I'm going to have it. God says that's incorrect. Belief simply means to obey simply means to obey. It's almost impossible to try to imagine something that you're praying for to happen. That takes a lot of willpower and effort, effort to try to believe something and just keep it. I told you a few weeks ago that faith is not faith until it's given away. But the church has told us just have faith, just keep the faith. Well, that is not faith. That is ineffective faith because faith is not activated or faith is not uh, gives life until it is first released and given away. Here we go. We're going back to faith meaning trust. So what I'm going to do tonight, I need to untrain you somewhat uh, from of these words that have been spoken to us um, over the course of our entire walk. And it has somewhat crippled our, our walk with Christ. Uh, because, again, we're, we are using these words like faith and belief, uh, which these are actually um, old King James Version uh, 1692 words. And we don't have a proper understanding of what these words are today. So let me show you. So he says your belief system has been compromised and the people have uh, settled for a standard lesser than God's desire. He said they have, they have settled for a standard lesser than God's desire. And this is what's happening to most of us in our lives today. Because the people, Christians, are, are viewing life from this external perspective. And because if it's from an external perspective, it has limitations. And... When you see these limitations, it compromises your faith because what you think is real, God says it's not. And I'm going to go deep tonight. Uh, just bear with me. I'm going to try and make it as plain as I can. Uh, but I want you to understand how God is looking at this, this whole th walk of faith. Okay. What you think is real, God says it's temporary. You say, well, that, what, what, what do you, you mean, preacher? Everything you see, smell, taste, touch, and handle, God says that is not real. You say, it's impossible. I can see it. I can smell it. I can taste it. I can, I can feel it. God says that's temporary. Now, if you exist or you abide and you live in this temporary world, you will you will come up against so many limitations, so many obstacles, so many challenges, because this external world is not eternal as the internal world is. So God says 
Everything that exists in the natural realm is temporary simply because uh, like Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I shall return. In other words, we can't take it with us after we pass away. The only things that go with us after we decease are the things that are internal or eternal, which are the spiritual things like faith, love, joy, peace, righteousness, holiness, things that you cannot see, smell, touch, taste, or handle. And what the people of God are doing is they are viewing life and seeing life from this external perspective that always produces negativity. Always going to produce negativity. And therefore, because of this negativity influence, it begins to slowly decrease your faith or you begin to compromise your belief system by what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, what you feel. And now your, your level or your belief system is compromised by what you're doing in the external realm. And this is why prayers are not being answered. This is why blessings are being hindered from coming to you because of this compromise, this settling for a lower standard than God's desire. It says they've settled for a level of quality and quantity. What is lower than required. They've settled for a level of quantity and quality than what is God's Desired. God has a high standard. He has a high standard of living. He has a high standard of blessing. But many Christians have not achieved that standard because their belief system has been compromised by the externalities on what they see, smell, touch, taste, or handle. And this is why healing has not been, been, been given. It's not that God wants you to be, doesn't want you to be healed, is that people are are being influenced by a lot of this negativity in and around their external life. So they have made an exchange, an uneven exchange, for something less than what you deserve. They have made an uneven exchange for something that is less than what you deserve. And this is the trick of the enemy is to get you to settle for something less than God's desire, to get you to settle for something than less than what you deserve. God says, because of their belief system, has been compromised. Second Chronicles 20 and 20 says, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. It says, Believe his prophets, and so shall ye prosper. Now, when we read this text, and we've heard this text for a while. If you've been walking with Christ, been in the church. Again, our minds tell us that if I just believe, if I just have this mental understanding of just believing, I will be established. If I believe his prophets, I believe the prophetic word, I shall prosper. No, because belief has to do with obedience. Obedience to the word, obedience to the statutes, his commandments. And we got to talk about this tonight. And we got to go to the root of the problem. Because if we don't, and if we skim across of these words, these terms that we're using, we're not going to get to, to the real deep issue. Because if I were to ask most Christians, are you obedient? They would automatically say yes. Automatically. If I were to ask most Christians, uh, are you faithful? They would say, yes, I'm faithful to God. But that's not addressing the issue. Because the issue is much more deeper than uh, for someone to pers pers say that they are obedient or they are faithful. The issue is simply that 
their belief system has been compromised by this negativity. So we got to get to the negativity part because I'm about ready to show you that it's in the scripture. That God has already told, talked about it, about the negativity part that is in us, that is stopping God from doing what he wants to do in our life. Watch this. God will not work in your life until you obey him. Now, you'll have limited amount of grace, maybe some favor here and there. But God will cannot fully work into your life until you come to a place of strict obedience to him. That is belief. He says, believe in the Lord your God or believe in Yahweh your Elohim and you shall be established. To mean to be established means to have courage or firmness of mind have courage or firmness of mind. Notice how it's all of this is going to connect to belief or believing in God as well as to be safe and secure. So to be established means to have courage, to have firmness of mind and to be safe and to be secure. He says, believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. In other words, to put confidence in their advice or the prophetic word that is being spoken. Not simply, just simply a prophet. Uh, that may sometimes be the case, but just the word of God that is being spoken through the inspired preacher. To have that confidence in their advice and that word or the prophetic word, the word of the Lord that goes forth. To have confidence in that. He says, so shall you prosper. Now, again, our minds, when we think of prosper, our minds strictly go straight to material. Because we live in a material world, we've been uh, indoctrinated by this westernized culture that everything is material. So we have viewed, and even the church has somewhat indoctrinated us as to mean prosperity is always something material, which it is not. He's talking here, he says that your wishes or your desires will go beyond your expectations. That your wishes, your desires will go beyond your expectations. That is what God calls prosperity. However, that will never happen until we get the understanding and our faith or our belief system is uncompromised. It will not be compromised anymore. Obviously, God is challenging us to grow to another level of faith because God wants to do something greater in your life, but he needs your Belief. He needs your obedience. Now we go to another word called faith. Faith. We hear this word. We've read this word in the Bible. We've heard this word numerous of times in the Christian walk of faith. But I got news for you tonight. We're going to eliminate this word because it has put actually a stumbling block before many Christians, many believers who do not have the correct understanding of what faith is according to the Bible. Let me tell you what faith is. Simply one word, trust. That's what faith is. Faith simply means trust. So when you see the word faith, you replace that word with trust. To have faith in God simply means to trust in God. To believe in God simply means to obey God. When you see the word believe, remove that and replace it with obey. So God says he needs you to trust him and obey him. Without faith and without trust, nothing can happen. It's a relationship. When you trust someone, you obey someone. And, and this is what's crippling you. It's because you say you have faith in God, but you do not trust him. And because you do not trust him, you do not obey him. You see how these words can, can really, if we're not careful, can kind of trip us up. Whatever you trust in, whoever you trust in, you are obedient to. If you don't trust, you don't obey. 
And this is why I examine and I look at Christians' lives to see what they're doing because whatever they're doing, it's going to come out in their lifestyle. It's going to come out in their behavior, not so much through their tongue because there's many Christians, and I want to talk about it tonight, who are speaking this negativity in their life and expect to be blessed. They're speaking a curse in their life, but yet they want God to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon them. And it's not happening. And it's never going to happen. And this is a cycle that many Christians are going through year after year after month. And nothing is changing or impacting their life because they are stopping their own self through this negative talk. This external world that they spend most of their time in, mind you. You got most Christians who spend five, ten minutes in the spirit. And then rest of the time they spend in the natural. But they want God to do great big things. Let me tell you, child of God, that's not how it works. You got to sow to the spirit in order to reap from the spirit. You can't spend hours and days and nights in the natural realm and then give God 15 minutes and expect something big to happen in your life. It will never happen. Your belief system has been compromised. You have a distorted vision or a distorted image of who God is. God, watch this, God is not going to lower his standard for any of us. Either we meet his standard or that's it. That's it. He's not coming down to bend for you, for me, for anybody else. He has a set standard. But what the enemy does, he understands that there's a high standard to walk with God. There's a desire that God has to meet and go beyond our expectations. But if he can keep you in this natural, temporary, corruptible world that speaks to you, that dictates to you, that talks to you, that's full of limitations, your belief system will eventually become compromised and you will settle and you will settle again and you will keep settling and settling because he'll keep working on you and chipping at you and throwing things at you. And then finally, you just take it and say, well, I guess this is the way I'm supposed to be. I guess this disease is supposed to be in my body. I guess I'm supposed to be sick. And I see it and I hear it and it's bothering not only me, it's bothering God because God says no. You don't settle for sickness. You know how I can tell people uh, have been have been impacted by sickness and disease is they began to actually call the disease my sickness, my disease. Now, how absurd is that? How how you have already declared ownership over your sickness and your disease. It's, you're confusing the angels, child of God. The angels don't even know what to do. I'm healed one day. I'm delivered one day. And then the next day, I'm f I don't feel good. My I, pain comes in. And listen, that pain that you feel in your body, watch this, becomes more real to you than the word of God. And you can deny it all you want to. Because watch this. You only believe. You only do what you believe in. If you believe the pain is more real than by his stripes I am healed, then that pain in your body is going to dominate and control your life. And the word of God will be ineffective. I don't care if you quote scriptures. I don't Listen, you don't get healed by quoting scriptures. You don't get healed by memorizing scriptures. You can do that all day unless you believe and obey and trust and stand on scripture. Nothing's going to happen in your life. I promise you that. I promise you that. And what the enemy is doing to most Christians, a lot of Christians, he is inflicting them with this negativity stuff. To the point that it is actually in their heart in which God is working, trying to work in your life. And you are speaking this stuff in the atmosphere all around you. Angels can't do nothing. Watch this. 
Matthew 13, 58. Listen to this. This is a powerful scripture. And he, meaning Jesus, did not do mighty, many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And this is what's happening. Jesus, as powerful as he is, the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, cannot do many mighty works in your life because of your unbelief. You say, well, what is unbelief? Well, I've searched it. I've got the definition from a Greek perspective and not from an English perspective because if you read it in the English, you're going to say, well, uh, I don't have unbelief. I have faith. Well, this unbelief word simply means negativity. It means negative. It can mean doubt, but it means negative because we can talk about doubt and that's just skimming the surface because many Christians will not confess that they have doubt. But they will talk about or they will relate to negativity going on in their life. Even Jesus Christ himself could do no mighty works there because he was limited by their negativity. All power was present at that moment to heal. The Bible says he laid his hands on a few sick people and that was it. He couldn't perform a miracle. He could not go beyond their wishes or their expectations or their desires because of their unbelief. What is unbelief? Well, unbelief is simply what opposite of what belief is, which is trust. So we can say he could do no mighty works there because of their lack of trust. Because of their lack of trust. And this is where most Christians are having their problem walking with God is because they look at, oh, unbelief, I don't have that. But you do got lack of trust. And no mighty work can be performed in your life because of a lack of trust. It's not that you don't have enough faith. Because most Christians will have faith. Little faith, weak faith, strong faith, great faith. It's that unbelief or that lack of trust or that negativity that can take it all away. It's the unbelief has always been the problem, not your faith. The unbelief, the negativity. The Bible says he marveled at them. In other words, he was astonished that here is Christ can do more than what they can expect, more than what they can ever imagine. But he was limited by their lack of trust or their unbelief. In some cases, though not all, faith is made the condition to receiving a cure. And Christ saw it proper to make it so here. He performed some miracles. In other words, it was connected to their faith. And without faith, he could be, he was limited. But then there are other cases that God's grace has, will, will, can, will override, in some cases, override your unbelief or your lack of trust. We thank God for his grace because there may have been times and I'm sure in all of our lives that we have, we were at a place of lack of trust. We had unbelief, but God's grace overrided that and did not connect the blessing, the breakthrough, the miracle, the healing to our faith or our lack of trust. He simply just went on and done it because he's God. He has every right to do that. God overlooks things in our life, realizing that we are human, that we have limitations, that we don't always have great faith. And we don't always have a, a, a level of faith uh, at a high degree. But God challenges us because he says that you may go from grow from faith to faith or from one level of trust to another level of trust. Child of God, you ought to examine at the end of your end of the year as we're coming to your level of faith. 
or your level of trust with God. It should be more than last year. And it should be more than the year before. If your level of trust and your level of faith is not growing, you must examine your salvation. You must grow in God from one level of trust to the next level of trust. It ought to grow. It ought to uh, blossom. It ought to perform because God is looking at this level of trust in our lives. He said he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them, but he could not do many mighty miracles because of their unbelief or the negativity that is being influenced in and around their lives. And he marveled at their unbelief. He was amazed. It is the Greek word translated apitsitia, meaning faithlessness, unfaithfulness, disobedience, and negativity. Again, if we were to talk about faithlessness, most Christians, they would shy away from it and say, no, I'm faithful. They would be able to talk about uh, disobedience. You may have a few, but most Christians will say, I'm obedient. But when we talk about this negativity, now we're getting to the root of the problem because every Christian, everyone, you can see that there's something negativity in your life that is trying to compromise or corrupt your belief system if it hasn't already had. Christ's power was hindered not because it was limited. He had all power, but by the lack of moral conditions in which his power could flow through. We got to talk about this because again, we're looking at these words in the Bible and we're not getting a full definitional understanding of what they are. Okay. Now he's talking about a lack of moral conditions, a lack of moral conditions. Okay. Watch this. What are some of the moral conditions in which his power can flow through? So I'm going to show you first, what are the moral conditions that a Christian must possess and have in order for Christ's power, Christ's grace, his blessing to flow through in your life. Because if you don't have these, you won't have it. Number one, love. It's a moral condition. The love of God, the love of humanity, the love of the people of God, and the love for everyone. God's love. That's a moral condition. Peace. Joy. Righteousness. Faithfulness. Sanctification, purity, holiness, cleanliness. Now, these are moral conditions in which every child of God should have, should be striving to have, should possess in order for blessing to flow through Christ's power to flow through in your life. If you do not have them, the Bible calls what you don't have sin. All right? So we've seen the word sin all through the texts of the scriptures. We've heard it, but we don't know what God says sin and what sin is. Watch this. God calls sin immorality. God sees sin and he calls sin immoral. Anything that is immoral against what I just read to you, God says that is sin. And if that exists in your life, that will stop or block up the channel of grace and blessing into your life. Anything immoral. Now we're going to get to some of these issues that most of us or Christians are experiencing. Drinking is immoral. Smoking is immoral. Gambling is immoral. Premarital sex is immoral. Lying, stealing, cheating, gossiping, backbiting. All of these are immoral sins. If they exist in a child of God's life. You are hindering and stopping Christ's power 
and Christ's grace to flow in your life. No matter how long you pray, now what you believe in, and what you stand on, God says, I can't get it to you. I can't let it flow to you. You have hindered it for yourself because now you are immoral, immorality, the way of the world, the course of the world, which I did not call you into. We're going to talk about it tonight. Therefore, I can't do what I want to do in your life. I can't perform the miracle in your life because now you are lacking these moral conditions. Which I just read to you. Listen to what Jeremiah 5 and 25 says. Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withheld good things from you. Well, that's obvious. We don't need to interpret that. The word of God is very clear on what this is. But Christians, they shy away from that. They say, oh no, that doesn't reply to me. Yes, it does. Because we're talking about an immoral condition that's going on in children of God's lives. This immorality that has caused you to compromise your belief system. The things in the context of the text would be during the time when God would send rain for the harvest that they would produce the fruit from the ground. From the prophet's point of view, this rain at that particular time was withheld from this people of God because of the wickedness that was dwelling in their lives. They were immoral. So now we can look at sin in a whole new different perspective, I hope. Sin is simply immorality. You can't do it and be a child of God and expect to be blessed. It doesn't work that way. God is not going to settle or compromise his standard. We must reach his standard of holiness, sanctification, love, joy, peace, purity, cleanliness, godliness. These are moral conditions that we have to have in order for Christ's power to flow through in our lives. Watch this. Today we would say that anything that comes down from the heavens, anything that's coming down from the heavens, every good and perfect gift come down from the Father of lights, from, the, from above. So your blessing is coming down. Your blessing is coming down from the heavens. It's not that God doesn't want you to have it, but they're being withheld. They're being blocked because of a immoral condition of God's people. Look at verse, what Isaiah says, 59 and 1 and 2. He says this, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. His hand is not shortened, his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. In other words, God hears only the prayers of faith or the prayers of those that believe or the prayers of obedience. Remember, belief means to obey. Faith means to trust. He says, but your iniquities. Iniquity is another uh, word of sin. It means deep sin. Iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins or your immorality, your immoral condition have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Drinking, smoking, lying, gambling, stealing, fornicating, adultery, uh, cheating, backbiting, gossiping, malicious, bitterness, all of this immorality. God says that's sin. That's what's blocking their blessing from them. They're still participating and still living in this type of lifestyle that God says, I did not call you to live in it. You must come out of it. This is what it means to be separated or to come out from the world because this is what the world is doing. And I don't understand why Christians are still participating in this stuff. Knowing that the world is, is, is on fire. The condition of this in the state of this world is in a condition that anything can happen at any time. 
that you're not even safe anywhere these days and you're playing Russian roulette every time you participate in a work of darkness. Let's talk about it. Because the Bible says works of darkness is what we used to do when we were unsaved or living in the world. Because everything that's happening evil seems to happen at night, but now it's happening during the day. And you're not safe anywhere, especially during this time of year, because now we're in the holiday season. And you know what the world is doing and Christians participating in this thing. Let me let me show you something. When you are out the will of God, hear me clearly. When you are out the will of God, you are out from under the protection of God. You can't claim God's protection if you are someplace you should not be. There is no angelic protection. Now, in some cases, if you want to play with your life like that, go ahead. But angels are only assigned and only protecting children of God who are walking in the will of God. But you're going to have Christians who are going to go out and do what they're going to do no matter what. Knowing the, the insanity of some of this stuff that I'm seeing on on TV. You get re we're getting ready to come to a new year. And most Christians, and a lot of Christians, I wouldn't say most, some of them, some of y'all are gonna go out and be at these hazardous places in which you are not called to be. But you know what? You know what? You know what I found out? A lot of Christians listen to the devil. And they can't recognize his voice because it sounds like them. And it's a still small voice, just like almost like God. And you know what? You believe, oh, it never happened to me. That never happened to me. And you listen to that still small voice and it can happen to you just like it happened to anybody else. You are out from underneath the protection of God. You say, well, I'm I'm safe. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't get drunk and I, I know why it don't have to be you these days because you got maniacs who are walking in bars with a gun. You've got maniacs who are walking in Walmart with a gun. You've got maniacs who are driving around with a gun. It don't have to be you. You could just be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Let me tell you something. Saints of God, children of God, on New Year's Eve, you should be only at one or two places. Church or home on your knees, praying it in. That's the safest place to be. Is home or in church. If you're not in church, you should be bringing the New Year in on your knees. Thanking God that he has spared your life again another year. Because guess what? And here is the, here's the reality of it. And it frightens me. Some people, some people, God will not allow to enter into next year. He'll cut them off December 31st. You watch what I tell you. He'll call them home. And and it frightens me not to fear that my fear of my life. It gives me a respect for God. It gives me a respect for my life to see how precious life is and how quick it can be going. I know a young lady a few years ago. She was went out with her friends. Going out to have a good time like most of us do. We go out to have a good time. But guess what? She got hit by a drunk driver and lost her life that night. Never made it back home. Her bed was that hospital cooling board. Happen, saints. If I was your pastor, I would tell you to stay home. Stay home. Do not be at these bars and these clubs and these public gatherings where all these people are just out of their mind. People are losing their minds today because they are full of stress there's lack of money, there's things going on, and people are just losing it. You're not safe. And God knows if Christ comes back. What if Christ comes back? 
Will he see you at the places you are in darkness? I don't want him to see me there. I want to be in the light. So when he comes back, he can say, oh, there's David. I'm going to take him home with you. I don't want to be in darkness. I want to be in the light. Watch this. He says, it's not that the Lord's hand is shortened. He wants to bless you. He wants to extend his grace and his mercy and his power towards you. But because of immoral sins has hidden his face from you so that he cannot hear our prayers. He cannot hear or answer your prayers because of this immorality. It wasn't not that the rains didn't fall or the harvest was less. The blessing was there, but the wickedness of the community, it blocked up the channels through which should have reached the people. And this is what God is saying tonight. Their channels are blocked up. The channel between earth and heaven is, is blocked because of the immorality in their life or because of the negativity that you are speaking out of your mouth. And I'm going to talk about it in these next few weeks because we need to understand about how death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you got Christians who are speaking death one day, life the other day. I'm healed. I don't feel good. I can do all things through Christ. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Death and life just coming out of their mouth. And now your blessing, your deliverance, your healing, your miracle is blocked up right over your head because of what's coming out of your mouth. Because what's coming out of your mouth, watch this, is connected to the heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This is why all I do is listen to folk. I can tell exactly what's in your heart. All I got to do is just be quiet and listen to what people got to say. Because whatever is in their heart is coming right out of their mouth. Sin deprives us, deprives us of God's blessings. You can't keep smoking, drinking, fornicating, adulterating, gambling, stealing, lying, and fighting. And then say, Lord, I believe. You, shut, you short circuit the power when you do that. You deceiving yourself. And uh, Listen, the, when the Bible says be not deceived, know what it really means? Stop lying to yourself. Many Christians are lying to themselves. Committing these immorality sins and then believing God. Watch this. Hebrews 11 and 6. I'm coming to a close. But without faith, we've heard the scripture, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Here we go. From our minds, we say, okay, all I got to do is have faith. Faith means trust. But without trust is what it's saying. It is impossible Without trusting God, God says it's impossible to please him. You must trust him. How do you trust God? You let go. You let go. This is how you trust him. You let go. And this is, the, this is why uh, um, tests keep coming to you and uh, trials keep coming to you because God is, watch this, when he's testing your faith, He's testing your level of trust. That's what it is. Remove this word faith because it's, it's, it's not working anymore. We've got to replace it with trust. So he says, when you, uh, uh, the test comes, it comes to test your level of trust so that you can let it go. And when you let it go, God has always been trying to for you to enter into a rest. He wants you to rest. He's trying to push us into a rest. And in order to enter a rest, we've got to trust. In order to trust, we've got to let it go. And the more you let go, the more you're not dependent upon self, the more you're entering into this rest state that he wants us to be in. As long as you got your hands on it, 
and you're in control on it, God says, you're not trusting me. You don't have, you, you, it's impossible to please me. That's not faith. You got to trust. Let it go. I trust you. My hands is done. I'm going to enter into my rest. Goes on. He says here, he says, that believe, must believe that he is. Must believe that he is. Not saying, I believe he is. I believe he is. No, no, no. It means I obey. I obey him. I obey who he is. Who he is, God. I obey God. Because he is able. Because he's God. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, the blessing will come if you continually to diligently seek him. Here's another thing that's happening in your life. People want to be healed and delivered and blessed when they want to be healed, delivered and blessed. And what happens, what's happening is when God don't heal you or deliver you or bless you, when you want it to happen, you give up. You give up. And when you give up, you know what you're doing? You're already demonstrating to a spirit that you don't trust him. You don't trust him. No matter what you say now, you don't trust him because God is listening to your, not so much your words. He's watching your lifestyle. He observes behavior because behavior speaks to God, not words. And when people uh, don't believe or when people don't receive when they don't receive, there's only one place you're going, child of God. Is you're going to revert back to an old way. You cannot walk away from God and go forward. You can only, when you walk in the spirit, you're walking with God and you're walking forward. When you're not walking in the spirit, you're walking backwards. And you're going to revert back to an old habit, an old way. Our own way of, own mind of thinking. Always, every single time. And this is what's happening. As if God is on your time. No. God heals, delivers, sends breakthrough, gives a miracle on his time. Not our time. And Christians are falling away. And reverting back to our old way, even going back to the world because God don't move when they want them to move or God don't answer a prayer when they want them, God to answer a prayer. And now they revert back to this, this way of carnality because it's not in the spirit. You can't walk backward in the spirit. It's only forward in the spirit. Flesh is backwards. Anytime you walk away from God, you are reverting or walking back to a fleshly realm, meaning a natural external realm. And that, to most people, is real when God is saying that is not real. You've got to get out of this realm, this temporarily existence of things, and set your mind in the spirit and do the best you can to stay there, live there, abide there, speak there, walk there. And minimize your time in this external realm. All right. Again, faith is trust and belief is obey. Please get that tonight. Faith is trust. Belief is obey. Remove the word faith. Remove the word belief and just start speaking trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Faith and belief are old, again, old English 1692 words that they were talking about hundreds of years ago. If I trust you, I will obey you. If I don't trust you, I will not obey. All disobedience, watch this, all disobedience comes from a lack of trust. All disobedience comes from a lack of trust. All sin is disobedience. Let me show you how the how the the sin works and how sin is simply 
a lack of trust. You say, well, I trust God. Well, God doesn't see it that way because again, he's a spirit. He exists in the spiritual realm. The communication barrier is different from a spirit to a human being. So he's receiving things differently, whether you're saying them or not. So sin is disobedience. Watch this. And disobedience is a lack of trust. You say, well, how is sin a disobedience? Well, sin simply means you lack, you don't trust God. So whatever sin is prevailing in your life, you are actually telling God, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. Let me give you an example. Say, for instance, uh, you know, you, 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 you are a gambler or you, you, you spend money on gambling. You say, well, that's nothing wrong. It's just a few dollars here, a few dollars here. There's nothing I can afford it. Well, that's not how God sees it. If you're a Christian, you're basically inadvertently telling God, God, I don't trust you with my finances. I don't trust you to provide for my finances. So I need to go to the world in order to hope and believe something's going to happen that I would have money because I don't trust you my finances. Someone who's a fornicator. I don't trust you, God, to meet my sexual needs or to give me the patience to wait for my spouse, my partner, so that I get into the marriage so I got to satisfy my needs for myself. Whatever sin is, sin is unbelief. Sin is a lack of trust. Whatever sin is committing in your life is simply because you do not trust God. Whether you say it or not with your words, you are telling the spirit of God, I don't trust you. I got to meet this for myself. I got to do this for myself. I don't have enough patience to wait. I've got to satisfy this desire now. Lack of trust. God says that's disobedience. That is sin. Without trust, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe or he who comes to God must obey that he is God and that he is able. Romans 4 and 3, and I'm going to close. For what does, the, the, what does the, the scripture say? This is Paul talking. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. You've heard that scripture before, right? So Abraham believed or Abraham trusted God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. In other words, God says, all right, Abraham, because you trust me, I'm going to stamp my righteousness on you. And now whatever you do is going to be righteous. I don't see your sin. I'm going to, you're going to be righteous in my eyesight. Okay. Now in Abraham's case, it was trust. It was trust. Not just simply, I believe you, God. Okay, God spoke to Abraham, said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham didn't say, okay, Lord, I believe. No, he didn't. He said, all right, God, I trust you and I'm going to obey. I'm going to obey. He said this, the trust, his trust in the fulfillment of the divine promise that God gave to Abraham. What was the promise? Again, I'll make you father of many, many nations. He heard God speak to him in an audible voice. He believed it, but he didn't say, okay, Lord, I believe and he kept on living. He said, no, God, I'm going to obey whatever you say. God said, all right, take your son and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Whoa, that's obedience, right? Again, it all goes back to trust and obedience. Let's read it. Let me let's, let's read this verse. Let's go back and read it. I got it right here. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who against hope believed in hope. Who against hope believed in hope. What does that mean? Well, it was impossible because Abraham was 100 years old. His wife was 100 years old, past the age or the time of childbearing. The Bible says her womb was closed. Abraham was 100 years old. The Bible said he was, he was past the age of childbearing. Abraham was 
Abraham was impotent, if you don't mind me saying so. His reproductive organs had shut down. Sarah was 100 years old. Her womb was unfertile. But against hope, he believed. In other words, he did not look at the natural circumstances that was talking to him. He did not look, oh, my wife is too old. She can't get pregnant. He didn't look at that. He didn't say, oh, I'm too old. I can't uh, have a baby. He didn't look at the natural circumstances. He trusted and he believed God because God had given him a promise. This is what he says. He believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations according to so what shall be spoken, so thou shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, or his level of trust was not weak. He considered not his own body already dead. In other words, his sexual reproductive organs was gone. He didn't look at that. He didn't focus on the external. He kept his eyes on a promise and he kept trusting in God because he had a word from God. Watch this. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not. That word staggered means back and forth. This, like this. Stagger. Like a drunk man. A drunk man staggers. Goes back and forth. The Bible says he didn't stagger. And Christians are staggering today. They're going back and forth because their belief system has been compromised. They're going one day to the other, from one minute to the other, and this is their faith. Back and forth, back and forth. Staggering. Because your mind and your eyes are looking at what you see, smell, touch, taste, hear, or feel, and saying that's real, the Word of God is not. You're saying, if God don't do it in this time, I'm going to do this, 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 that, and the other. He says, he staggered not of the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't stagger at the promise through a lack of trust or a negativity. Because in this realm of the realm of the natural, it's always going to be something negative coming at you. But was strong in faith. Again, let's remove the word faith. His, his level of trust was high. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to let go of this natural circumstance. He said, I'm not going to look at my wife's barrenness. I'm not going to look at my impotency. I'm just going to trust God. That spirit. He said, I'm staying in the spirit of trusting God. And the Bible says, and being fully persuaded or fully convinced fully convinced that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. He believed in hope, meaning his faith was grounded, his trust was grounded in hope. Watch this. It wasn't as if he was just hoping for something to happen. Hope has an anchor or hope has a destination. You don't hope for something and just say, I'm hoping, and your hope is just going out. It, it has to be connected to an object. Because hope is not hope unless it is connected to something in the spirit. God. Okay. Because if you're just hoping, guess what? It's just going into the atmosphere and it, and it has no destination. Abraham had a hope. He had a destination. He says, yes, what? You know what? I'm hoping. Hoping not meaning, I hope it's going to happen. Hope. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible's talking about. He said, one day I'm going to be a father of many nations. He began to speak it. He began to declare it. He began to believe it. He began to obey God. But guess what? He died. And he wasn't a father of many nations. That's a whole other different topic. Watch this. Okay. He says, yes. One more scripture and I'm closing. 
He obeyed against all probability. He obeyed against all probability. And this is what you must do tonight. You must obey against all probability. No matter what your finances says, no matter what your mind says, no matter what your body says, no matter what the family says, no matter what the job says, no matter what your employer says, you must obey God beyond all probability. And stand on a promise. What? This word is more real, God says, than your situation, your circumstance, your sickness, your disease, your infirmity, your pain, your stress, your distress, everything that you can experience in the natural realm. God says this is more powerful. This is more strong. This right here can change. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, and we love this verse, whatsoever things ye desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. There we go. We can dance and shout all, all, all night on that verse. But what does it really mean? Because all of us have said, you know what? I've been praying and, and I've been asking and I have desires, but I haven't received them right yet. So what's, what's, the, what's the issue? What's the problem? Whatever things you desire when you pray, trust that you will receive them and you shall have them. Trust God that you shall receive them. Again, belief is not something saying, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it in Jesus' name, in Jesus, 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 Jesus' name. No, I trust, I trust God. I let go. See, that's trust. I let go. That's trust. You can't say, I got it, and then say, I trust you, Lord. No, I let go. The desires must be in accordance to his will. And we've got it wrong. We pray and ask God to bless it. When God says, if you find out my will first, it's already in the will, you just pray his will through. So it's just the opposite. We have to find out what the will is and then pray. And then we request and then make the petitions. We're not doing that. We're going straight to what we want, what I want, what I need, what I want God to do for me. And then not even observing, well, is it in the will? Because if it's not in the will, you may get it, but you may lose it. And if you get it, it may be a heartache and it may cause hardship and it may bring depression and it may bring more stress. Again, children of God, you can get things out of the will of God. Very deep. All you got to do is just work for it. But again, there's consequences that's going to come after it if you get it on by your own way of doing it, your own flesh or because of whatever carnal reason you may have it. And it's going to bring disappointment. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. In other words, the blessing of the Lord doesn't bring sorrow. It's what we call a blessing. And what we get from our own point of view, our lusts, it brings sorrow and disappointment. Our desires must be according to his desires. This is why it takes reading and meditating the word of God to understand, to know what his will is. It's very easy. It's not hard. Once upon a time, I used to think the will of God was this far thing that you can barely get and barely achieve. It's really quite very simple. In fact, all of the things that's walking with God is relatively simple, but our minds exaggerate it. And we make it more than what it really is, and we miss the whole, the whole thing. The will of God is very simple. And let me share this with you. The will of God is not always better. It's not. Not always. We think better is blessed. Not always. The will of God is simply the will of God. And once you understand that, and you begin to see that, and God shows you that and reveals that to you, that's when you offer up the prayers because it's already in the will. In other words, you don't really have to ask for it. God says, I already got it in the will. I want you to have it. You don't got to spend days and nights and fasting and praying. All you got to do is receive it. But in order to receive it, you've got to have a life of moral condition and to get the immorality out of your life because your immoral immoral 
Reality, your sin is clogging up the, pot, the, the channel between you and God so that he cannot hear. Sins have separated us from the love of God and from the blessing of God and from God hearing us. The Bible doesn't say he doesn't hear us in the sense that he can't hear. He hear, but he can't respond. He can't bless. The angels of God have a tug of war fighting those devils like Michael did when, when Daniel was praying Took 21 days because he had to fight the prince of Persia in order to get Daniel the answered prayer. We don't want that. We want a clear channel between heaven and earth. Nothing clogging up the channel or the, the, the line that we have with God through immorality. That's all I have for tonight. I pray this has been a blessing to you tonight. Receive this word, share, and like this video. Again, join us on Thursday at 7 p.m. We are having our one-hour intercessory prayer. You can dial the prayer line, 609-633-4021. Again, that is 609-633-4021. Join us as we go into intercessory prayer. Lord willing, I will see you again next Sunday. If not, God bless you. Until I see you again.